Hello, welcome to the Shar Shar Show. Let's talk about it, where we focus on issues affecting our communities and much more. I'm your host, Sheree Vaughn, and I have with me a survivor of the COVID-19 virus. Please welcome to my show, Miss Etta Hinton. Welcome. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much for, you know, taking the time out to actually come onto the show to talk to my viewers a little bit about what you encountered and uh, and educating us a little bit more about this virus. So before Absolutely. We, yeah. So before we get started, um, how are you feeling like right now? So right now, and I, it's funny that everybody that I speak to asks me that question, right. and the truthful answer is I'm still recovering. Right. Although today is the day that they told me I could come out of quarantine, I'm still battling with um, being able to talk without getting short of breath. Mm-hmm. Um, I still have a cough. Thank God there's no fever. My taste and smell is bad. But there is still obstacles with trying to regain full strength. Right. Wow. Because I think actually I was reading, or I think I saw this video of this woman who said, um, you know, they say to be in quarantine for uh, two weeks at a time, but it's actually, shouldn't it be longer than that if they're still showing signs of having some of the symptoms? That's. That's my thought process, and that's why, although they told me that I can be out of quarantine today, I haven't left my house, and I don't plan to leave my home. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up doctor's appointment on Monday coming up, and that appointment is to be retested to make sure that I get a negative test this time and I'm not still positive because one of the things is – because we don't know about this virus is new to everybody. You can't just say that once you're quarantined for 14 days or what have you, the virus is out of your system, especially if you're still exhibiting any signs. And so because I am also an asthmatic, um, this part of the season is usually allergy season. So there's a debate whether it's allergies taking effect or is it still part of the COVID at work that's causing me to feel the way that I feel. Right. Okay. But we definitely want to, I want you to follow up with me with the results from that as well. So we can kind of figure out, you know, because I haven't spoken to anyone personally to find out, okay, well, after the 14 days, you know, if anyone has been retested in what was that? What was the results from that test? So I appreciate it. If you could follow back up with me after your uh, definitely. But I don't know how they do it in other states. But I know that in the state of Connecticut, in order to go back to work, you have to have two negative tests. And so there's another pastor that I am affiliated with, and her and her husband also tested positive. They were older. They are older. And the government had to clear them to go back. So yeah. it's mandatory for you to be retested, and you have to have two negative tests. But the hospitals are not saying that, and I can get into that further right. um, if you would like me to. Yes, most definitely. Um, yeah, when we start talking about the hospital and how they conduct it, um, you know, handling your, your the virus and what they administered, yeah, definitely I want to talk about that as well because, you know, you get one version here, one version there, you know, you don't know which one is the truth, and so it's always good right. to know someone who's actually on the inside, you know. Um, exactly. So you are in Connecticut, and so that's yes. where you um, contracted the virus. And so uh, what was the proper test? Because there are even videos out there that are circulating that are saying that the test is done this way and the test is done that way. It was one video I saw where the nurse inserted uh, the swab into the lady's nostrils, but she, all the way back, she went all the way back up. Yes. And she left it there. No. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, no, this can't be. No, no. 
So because of how quickly um, things escalated for me, um, just to answer that question, and then we can get back into it. Mm -hmm. But I I got tested twice. I went to my primary care doctor um, because I had got a fever, and then I had all the other symptoms. So what he did was he had me lay all the way back on his stretcher, Mm -hmm. and I had to tilt my head back. And they took the swab and they put it all the way back up both nostrils. Jesus. And so a few days later, when I had to get rushed to the hospital, um, the doctor in the emergency room, because the test results hadn't came back yet, the emergency room had to re-administer the test to me. And they followed the same thing. I had to hold my head all the way back. They put it all the way um, back to my nose, um, the swab in each nostril, but it was never left there. Um, the difference with uh, the hospital testing and my primary care testing, the hospital had a rapid response. I got the results back in four hours as opposed to okay. um, the when you go to your primary care doctor, they have to wait three to four days for the results. Okay. So I'm trying to figure it out um, because, again, you know, you hear so many stories. I'm saying that they will go to the hospital and they wouldn't be able to get the test back for five to seven days. So do you think that's just an area thing? Well, it depends, it depends on if they went to the emergency room mm-hmm. um, because now here this, and I might be going too far. This is what I'm about to say could be going into how I contracted it, Mm -hmm. but I had to take two little babies because I'm also a foster parent Mm -hmm. and I had to take them to the emergency room because they spiked high fevers. And when I took them in, they wouldn't even test the babies. The emergency room wasn't testing for COVID at that time. They said we, I had to call their primary care doctors and get them tested through them. So in, although they examined the children, they didn't test the children. But by the time, a week later, by the time I had to get rushed there for the same symptoms, they were testing. Wow. So it, it could depend on the time period because this thing is developing so rapidly, right. things are changing daily. Right. Okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah. We, ooh, it's so much. Okay. So... Tell us a little bit about how you contracted the virus. And, um, again, they, they're they saying that, you know, it affects more people who have underlying diseases. Do you have any? Or was you just a clean-cut, you know, individual? Uh, let us know about that as well. Okay. So I do have underlying illnesses. I've had asthma my whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, later on in life, I – it was discovered that I have a clotting disorder as well. Mm-hmm. I also have, it's, it's, they're still trying to figure it out, but um, I'm a complicated individual, mm-hmm. even my personality. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so I've always had sickle cell trait, okay. but now they're seeing that my numbers are going um, so high that it's, telling them that I actually have sickle cell disease. So I have a few factors, underlying mm-hmm. um, factors, that could have made me so success- susceptible mm-hmm. to get the disease. So the way I contracted it was, I, I, it makes me upset to talk about it, mm-hmm. but I did everything they told me to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was practicing social distancing. My house is clean. We got, we wasn't one of the ones scuffling to try to get disinfectants, bleach and all that. We had it all Mm -hmm. and we still have plenty of it. But again, I'm a foster parent. So um, everything was going on lockdown Mm -hmm. and DCF, which is the Department of Children's Families in Connecticut, called me. Um, Hysterically, we have these two babies. They came in our care last night. We need placement for them. They gave me their history. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? Since we're going in quarantine, 
um, it's a, it's a two year old little girl, a one year old little boy. I said, all y'all have to do, because I don't have anything here for them is provide me with some stuff until I can get to the store. When they brought me the baby, um, the social worker said to me, the little boy has been crying, but it's because he's teething. Um, then the little girl, I noticed she wouldn't eat anything. So when the social worker came the next day to bring the rest of their things, I said to the social worker, I said, I can't get her to eat anything. She's just fussy. She's not eating. She said, oh, no, she just like deli meat and Teddy Graham crackers. So those were the excuses they gave me. And so me being a mom already, you know, I'm paying attention because it's not okay for children to be in my presence and not eat. So I'm just paying attention. So they brought them to me on Wednesday, March 18th. But by Saturday, March 21st, fevers begin to spike in the children. And they were cranky and crying. And so on the weekends, you can't get hold of a social worker. You have to call a care line. And immediately when I called them, I was told, take them to the hospital. It's probably COVID. At that point, I was livid because my thing is, why are you already diagnosing these kids? If I'm just calling you and telling you a brief description about what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing is get them to the hospital. Let's see what the doctors say. Because the hospitals are locked down, me and my husband went, only one parent can stay at a time. Mm -hmm. So the kids are screaming to the top of their lungs. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not feeling well. Long story short, um, The doctors wouldn't test them, but what they did discover was they had the high fever and they had respiratory symptoms, um, respiratory infection, they said. So the paperwork, the discharge paperwork said possibly COVID. They couldn't name it because they didn't test them. So, you know, at that time, I'm calling DCF. I'm like, you got to come get these kids. Because I I have asthma, I have all these things, I cannot get sick. Mm. And I was told out of the social worker's mouth, well, since you're already exposed, you might as well keep them. Wow. Right. And so that's a whole nother story in right. itself. Well, mm-hmm. she was partially right. I, mm-hmm. Although they came and got the kids, the damage was done. Mm-hmm. By right. the kids left March 22nd. By Wednesday, March 25th, I couldn't smell anything, and I had a high fever. And I remember waking up saying to my husband, "Um, are you cleaning with pneumonia? Because pneumonia have like a chemical smell. It have a distinct smell. And he had candles burning in the house. He had bleach in the water, and I kept saying, babe, you don't have enough bleach in there. I smell nothing. And he's like, I'm about to kill us in here. I couldn't smell a thing. Um, later that day, I felt you could feel your body dwindling. It's like it sucks the life out of you. And I wow. felt that. So I got in the bed and I took my temperature and it slowly started elevating. It went from like 99 to 100. Next mm-hmm. thing I know, I was hitting 102. So I called my doctor. He had me come in the next day. He took the test. That was Thursday. By Saturday, uh, March 28th, I was being rushed to the hospital because I couldn't breathe. I couldn't keep nothing down. I couldn't. I was weak. <coughs> mm-hmm. I had mucus build up. It was, it was as if I was being suffocated. And they asked me, does it feel like asthma? I said, no. It, this asthma can't touch what this feels like. Mm-hmm. So that's the way I contracted it. Wow. I think that didn't leave anything out. Wow. I'm just digesting everything you just said because it's like, wow. Right. And I I put a post on Facebook because I was upset at the rhetoric that was going on. People blame folks for being outside 
and, you know, not practicing social distancing and all that. And I put a post that said, I did everything right. It was brought to me. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. This is why I'm walking around telling people now, don't let, I don't care if they're your aunts, your uncles, your cousins. If they don't live in your house, don't let them in because you don't know where they've been. You don't know who they've been around. And it's something that can be carried and brought to you. The healthiest person can have uh, COVID on the inside of them and don't know it, but because you have underlying issues, you'll get it from them and you'll be the one in the hospital fighting for your life. Right. Wow. And being that, you know, of course, you know, I know you. <laughs> I'm just right. like, wow. Yes. I'm never really speechless, but this is so serious and so deep that I'm actually really like, after hearing your story, it's like, I'm speechless. But, um, okay, so while you're in the hospital, how did they treat you? Did you of course, you didn't have to go on a ventilator, correct? Well, no. So when I got in the hospital, and I'm probably going to be public enemy number one, but I, I prefer to tell the truth. So that people will know right. um, we have a habit of painting a picture and it's false and right. making, um, allowing the victims to be re-victimized because no one is um, willing to speak out. Right. So when you walk in a hospital because COVID-19 is so mysterious. Serious. Nobody really knows what it is and nobody wants it. You're immediately treated as if you have HIV AIDS or you have the plague. Nobody wants to touch you. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants you to come around. They have barricades and, and um, police ropes up and you can't move past it. And so I had to say to them, I cannot breathe. I already been tested. Please help me for a nurse, for a triage nurse to come. And then they, they, they kind of like scattered to find PPE, um, wow. personal protective equipment. And so they took me in the emergency room, put me in the back. They realized my oxygen level was 90, which is not good. I was wheezing. I couldn't breathe. So they immediately, she put a mask on my face and said, don't take this off at all while you're here. Mm -hmm. And so they put me in a room, the doctors came running, and they asked me a few questions. But as they're asking me, I got people trying to put IVs in and put oxygen on me and things of that nature. <clears throat> and one of the questions he asked me, because they wasn't sure yet, they hadn't, I hadn't had a positive result come back yet. Right. Uh, so they had to do one too. But he said to me, he said, how is your taste of smell? Anything different with that? And I said, yes. And I told him what I said to you. Right. You know, I smell like the um, um, ammonia smell. I can't taste my food. And when I said those two things to him, he said, okay, I'm going to test you, but I really don't have to. You have COVID-19. We're admitting you. So... <clears throat> They, I needed a breathing treatment because I was really tight and um, I was wheezing a lot. The room that they put me in, they would not give me a breathing treatment. They had to wait to find a low pressure room. That's what it's called. Because if they gave me a nebulizer where I was, they was afraid that the mist of the nebulizer would come out and possibly infect other people because it's droplets coming out. Wow. So I had to sit there and wait and struggle with my breathing until they found a low pressure room to where that wouldn't have the effect. So wow. once they did that, they came to me and said, if you need a treatment, you're going to have to call us for it because we rather give you the inhaler than the nebulizer to protect others who are in the emergency room. So mm -hmm. then finally they get me, they admit me in and I go upstairs, they have a COVID floor. So if I could backtrack some, in the emergency room, there was absolutely nobody. There's nobody waiting, it's not packed. But when you go inside, when you go inside, there, some of the rooms were full, but 
I've been in a hospital a lot. There was no beds in the hallway. There were there were empty rooms, um, and there was it, it was space, so it's not crowded at all. Hmm. I get upstairs. You have a floor, and there's a few floors like this for COVID nineteen patients. So they get me in a room. They got all the signs on the door. Everybody got their hazmat suits on, and pretty much they said to me. If you test positive, you will remain in this room. If you don't test positive, we got to take you to another floor. Understandable. She, the nurse then said to me, here's a TV screen. It was like a computer monitor. Mm-hmm. She said, so that we don't have to come in and interact with you as much, we're going to talk to you through this computer monitor. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no, they gave you no privacy. They gave you no warning. If they needed to ask you a question, their face just popped up on the screen, and they're looking at you in your room, and they're talking to you all hours of the night, all hours of the day. So I asked them, I said, what's going on with housekeeping? Is anybody going to come in to clean up the room or to change the sheep? No, we're not. Because you have COVID, we're not allowing nobody to come in. So I said to them, I said, what about the germs that I'm releasing? Well, you already have it. You're the only one in the room, so um, it doesn't need to be clean. So I had to pretty much have another nurse who, you know, covered herself up to change my linen at least. They would not touch my things, and pretty much – if I called for a treatment or anything, it took them hours on end to come. Wow. So because I'm such an advocate, I'm laying in the bed not feeling well, but I'm listening to the other patients call for the nurse. And I remember one man said, can you please come get this out of my room? It's contaminated. And the reply from the nurse's station was, well, sir, it's contaminated because it's in the room with you. So this is why I have a bias to everybody praising all of the nurses and the healthcare workers, because I'm like, okay, some of them may be doing it from their heart, but a lot of them are doing it because you put a hundred dollars hour. I'm going to pay you a hundred dollars an hour or more to come do this work. But a lot of people don't have to die if people really care. Right. And I learned that right. being on the inside. Right. And it grieves my heart because I said, if I wasn't the person that I was, I'm going to advocate for myself. The only way I can't is if I'm, my eyes are closed and they cannot open. But right. short of breath and all, I had to fight for myself right. because I remember pressing a call bell and before I can ask for anything, I was being told, you have to wait a minute. And I said, but you don't even know why I'm calling you. You still have to wait a minute. I said, but you still don't know why I'm calling you. And she said, what can I do for you? I said, there's blood shooting out my arm. You still have to wait a minute. It took another hour for somebody to come in who was willing to assist with the, um, getting my IV situated. So, an hour. And so that's, that's, that. I asked the nurse, I said, how come every time my food comes to me, um, it's freezing cold? And she said, well, the problem is because we won't let dietary come in your room. It's sitting outside waiting until somebody's willing to bring it to the patient. She said, you're not the only one who complained about having cold food. And I'm not talking about a sandwich that's supposed to be cold or something like this. This is food, cooked food that they leave in the hallway until somebody's willing to bring it in the patient's room. Or the only way we get it heat up is if we request, nurse, can you please put this in the microwave? So it, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't. It wasn't something that, you know, I would want to go through again. And because I've been in the hospital a lot with other things and I have never seen this kind of treatment before, I said to my husband, I said, I feel like I got the plague because they don't want to help. They don't want to come near you. They don't want to touch you or anything. And so for the, for the older people who can't talk for themselves, 
who don't have an advocate and don't know what to say, I, it, it grieves my heart because I'm like, they don't have to die if right. somebody cared. Right. Wow. And I speak, I speak to this magnitude because if it was one or two nurses who did this, I would say, okay, there's a few in the bunch that, you know, just don't need. Everybody who I encountered was like this. I had one doctor who kept, who rubbed my back, who understood the pain I was in and who took care of me. Everybody else did not, they didn't want to stay in the room. They don't want to, uh, they have to take your blood like every 12 hours because they're looking for different levels in your blood to see if they elevate or what have you. And I got bruises on my arm. I've never been so battered in the hospital, but because they don't want to do it, they're making mistakes. And I have big hematomas on my arm still, and I was discharged last week. So I, I, I appreciate healthcare workers. I know it's not everybody, but they're, they're, no, they're not, they're there, but it's for the paycheck. Right. And that's so true. Um, and it's actually, it's, it's, it's always been that way. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even before the virus, you know, it's some people that go to work just for the paycheck, but not because mm-hmm. they actually care. For right. their clients or customers or you know right. other fellow employees, you know it's just it's sad. It's really sad. I don't know. Something needs to be done in the work system, definitely. I mean, in a lot of areas in life, but definitely in the in the healthcare system because, like you said, our elderly that don't have anybody or anybody that doesn't really have anybody, they can't speak for and they can't speak for themselves. You know, they're just like. Right. It's just crazy. It's just crazy to me. Wow. I was not <laughs> – I thought you were going to give me a totally, totally different story. I, I really have – I really thought <laughs> – I'm, I'm so sorry. But no, you're fine. <laughs> I want the real deal, and this is the reason why I wanted to talk, with, you know, with someone who was on the inside because certain things just didn't sit right with me. And right. And certain things still does not sit right with me, but I definitely wanted the real and, right. um, you know, even though it was unfortunate that you contracted it and I was, you know, like real sad and I was like praying for you at the same time, you know, I was like, I need to reach out to you and find out, mm-hmm. you know, what exactly and how was it like on the inside? Um, well, I remember you know. um, another thing that I said to the lady because I'm very vocal and I said, you know, it's not our fault that we have this virus. Right. We don't have to be treated like this. She said, well, you, you're right, it's not your fault, but because we don't know what it is, we're all afraid. So being fear will cause you to act in ways um, because you, you don't know what can happen. And it, it was... It was scary to me because after I got discharged out of the hospital, I got admitted on the 28th and I was discharged on April 2nd. I had to get rushed back to the hospital April 3rd because um, all the symptoms came back. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was severely dehydrated in less than 24 hours. And so they had to pump me with fluids. And um, when I came back the second time, I had to go back through the emergency room. Um, The the police, they have cops there making sure nobody break down the ropes and all that, what have you. He went to go find a nurse because there wasn't a triage nurse in sight. And there was another guy who worked there who I guess had some uh, problems with his side, but he came in after me. And when the triage nurse saw me with my mask on and saw the other guy, he went to help the other guy. And the cop said, no, she was here first. Mm-hmm. He said, no, she can wait. And so that's when another nurse came out and the cop said, y'all got to help this woman. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't want to help me because he seen that I was coughing. I had a mask and everything. So when I said I was COVID-19 positive already, He wouldn't even take my vital signs. And so, you know, they are fearful because they don't want to get it. And I understand that. 
but at the same time, you have a responsibility exactly. to help people exactly. and not treat them. And I, I said it out my mouth. I said, I was a little girl when HIV and AIDS came out. I said, but I now know what those people felt like. Because this is what they make people who have the virus feel like. Like we've contracted a uncurable disease. Right. And that's what I was going to add to that. Um, but you brought it. You know, you brought that in. That I understand that they're fearful, but they know what they're up against when they go to work. They know mm-hmm. that when they go to work, you're going to have probably some patients that's going to come in that may have COVID. Right. So you cannot say, I'm not going to deal with those patients because that's still your responsibility. And then you exactly. can be scared but still show compassion. Exactly. Because it could be you. Exactly. And that's what they yeah. need to understand. So speaking about medications, did they show you what they were giving you or did they just come in and tell you and inject you? Um, what were some of the medications they gave you or tried to give you? So because I'm very verbal, they mentioned the chloro, chloro, clique, whatever it's called, Mm -hmm. that um, Donald Trump is promoting. And um, I put my husband on the phone because I really couldn't talk. So I said to him, please speak to my husband. And my husband knows me. But because I have so many underlying health issues already, I also have a lot of allergies. And when he mentioned that they had to give me a pill and then some medicine through the IV, my husband said, don't you dare. Because he said, did you check to see if there was going to be an interaction with the medicines that she's already on? And if she, what if she's allergic to it? What are you going to do about it? And so the doctor said, well, we have our staff here. If there's a reaction, we'll be here to offset it. Well, the truth of the matter is, if I had a reaction to the medication, nobody would have known because they wasn't there. They didn't respond to call bells and they didn't come in constantly checking on you. So because my husband told them, do not give it to me, um, they, they didn't give it to me. The good thing is my primary care doctor make hospital visits. So, and because he knows my story, he came in and um, when, he, when they mentioned that medicine to him, he said, well, that's what I use for my lupus patients and for people with, I think he said arthritis or something like that. He said, don't give that to her because we don't know how she's going to respond to it. So they pretty much kept my lungs open with prednisone, which is a steroid. They... They gave me my inhalers, a steroid inhaler, and my um, rescue inhaler. They, they, um, this is the part that I left out. I needed oxygen, and I needed to be on a heart monitor. They didn't have enough, so I never got the oxygen on the heart monitor. So it was the grace of God mm. that I... I came out the hospital. They kept saying to me, we need to put you on these things, but we don't have enough on the floor. As soon as one free up, we're going to give it to you. Wow. I never got it. So I had to constantly um, take my asthma, asthma medication. Yeah. The chest pains felt like some, somebody was like sitting on my chest and stabbing me at the same time. So at first they was just pumping me with extra strength Tylenol um, every eight hours. Mm -hmm. And when that wasn't working, they added, without me knowing that first, they added oxycodone for the pain. Mm -hmm. And then when I asked them about it, they was like, we're giving you this because it's something stronger to take away the pain that you're feeling. Um, Mm -hmm. I also was treated with, they gave me Every medicine that I take at home, they added that in my regimen. But they also gave me, there was another pill that I can't remember um, the name of it, but it was supposed to um, open up my airways. I know it wasn't one of the medicines that they're trying, that that is not FDA approved. Mm 
okay. but I can't remember the name. But I was at um, I was at an emergency room. As soon as I got there, if I need to be resuscitated, can I be resuscitated? Can I be intubated? When I got upstairs and they came and told me that I tested positive, the man looked at me. He said, "We may need to resuscitate you um, or intubate you. Are we allowed to do that?" So I said, "Yes." Um, and I asked him, I said, am I going to die? And he looked at me and turned his head and said, I can't tell you that you're not. He said, but we'll do everything on our power to, um, bring you back if we can. I know that was very scary for you. Yes, it was. Yes, I was. Because because he wasn't allowed in there, correct? Exactly, right. He couldn't even bring me in the emergency room. He had to pull up to the hospital, let me out the car, and I had to walk in. Nobody even came with a wheelchair um, like they normally do to help the patients. And I had to walk in short of breath and everything and stand up against the wall and wait to be called. Okay, so for the most part of the medicines that they give you, they did show you or t- told you this is what they were giving you, except for the the other medicine for the for the pain. You said that was stronger than the Tylenol. The oxycodone, yes. Oxycodone. And I had to tell them, you know, because at one point it was only five milligrams, and then the nurse called me and said, "Well, you know, your doctor he upped the dose. You can have ten milligrams." I said, "But I didn't ask for pain medicine." I don't feel pain right now. Well, I think you should take it. And so I called my mother-in-law and my husband. I said, I need y'all to get me out this hospital because they're pushing this um, this oxycodone on me, which is an opioid. I said, they're trying to make me take this medicine, and I don't even need it right now. And so um, I, I'm always watchful. Unless, like I said, unless right. I'm unconscious, right. I don't care what pain I'm in. I don't care how bad I'm struggling to breathe. I'm going to be, I'm going to participate in what they're doing with me because they will, they'll slip anything on you. Right, especially when you go to sleep, you know? Yeah, right. It's like, exactly. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so when you went back the second time, how how long did you have to be in the hospital? Well, they didn't admit me, and I asked them not to because my thing is what what y'all did for me the first time, I my family could do better at home. So they were more concerned with making sure that I, would, I got the fluids in me because I was severely dehydrated. They couldn't find a vein. They stuck me like six times, and finally they had to use a pediatric needle to um, get into a small vein to give me fluid um, because less than 24 hours, one of the symptoms is um, you vomiting and diarrhea. And they sent me home that way. They sent me home still struggling with my breathing and everything. Mm -hmm. But because of the, um, and I'm not the only one, The, the sad news about it is, you know, you. I now know what survivors get guilt feel like because so many people that they discharged from the hospital sent them home. A few days later, we're hearing on Facebook, "Rest in peace." Right. Uh huh. And so, so it, you. Um, right. Like, why did they send you home and you wasn't feeling better? Oh, you, you they, didn't get a negative uh, reading and they sent you home. I, you know, I'm wondering. Exactly. They don't know what to do. So as soon as they feel like somebody is good enough to handle the rest on their own, mm. because when I came in the second time and told them, he said, if it's just diarrhea, that's fine. I'm not worried about it. You're just going to have to stick that out at home. But my whole thing with that was, if that if it's just diarrhea and that diarrhea is what got me dehydrated, how do you feel I can stick this out at home if I'm not keeping anything down or in? But they don't want to deal with it at the hospital. Hmm. Right. 
So it has given me some anxiety, you know, as much as I trust God, I know God, and I stay prayerful. Every time I see a rest in peace from somebody who was sent home from the hospital, the truth of the matter is they send you home with symptoms. And so they say to you, although you're going home, you still have to stay away from everybody in your house, keep yourself locked up in your room. Um, they told me stay in my room for three days once I get home, but you, my quarantine is not over until today, which is the 10th. And so, um, since I've been home, I still had a fever spike. I still had the, um, the nausea, the diarrhea, the shortness of breath, migraine headache. The only thing that stayed consistent is one of the symptoms is your eyeballs hurt. And I don't know what that is about, but you, you can't look left or right without feeling pain in your eyeballs. Wow. And so um, that, that left, I was able to smell again and I'm able to taste again. So those things are consistent. They, they didn't um, leave again, but even today, um, I don't have, I haven't had a fever in, in a few days. I haven't had, I'm still struggling with eating food and it's staying in. But for the most part, the only thing that I struggle with consistently is my breathing. And again, I'm not sure if it's because it's allergy season Mm -hmm. or if it's still virus related. So what are the things that you're currently doing at home? Are you doing any of the things where they're like, you know, do do the steaming, the hot? Uh, uh, I can't. So because the steaming also produces droplets and it's airborne, I have to wait. Although, So I came out of quarantine today, but they told me even with my nebulizer, don't use it until after April 10th because they don't want the steam or what have you hmm. to go into the air and infect the rest of the house. Hmm. So what I've been doing is my um, steroid inhaler, my rescue inhaler, uh, Vicks, vapor rub, stuff like that to try to keep me drinking a lot of water and I've been popping Tylenol like crazy because the pain, it, it literally feels like you're about to have a heart attack. Wow. Now, do you go back and see your regular doctor? On Monday, I go back to see him. Okay. And he's the one that's going to retest you? Yes. Oh, okay. So if it's, I mean, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, how much of an airborne is it? Because if that's the case, then why do they still have people, you know, going to work? Well, people shouldn't be. They really shouldn't be because people people are uh, accustomed to talking. They're accustomed to coughing and they probably not covering their mouth or coughing into their hands and touching something else mm-hmm. because it's, it's second nature to certain people. And just because you say cough in your sleeve or wash your hands for 20 seconds, the majority of people know to do that and probably do practice it. But there's a percentage of people who don't. Mm-hmm. And so people are still at risk. And I'm grateful because I had the option to work from home and just go on to work a few days. And the particular day that I was supposed to go in, I felt bad, but I said, let me tell my boss that I'm feeling a little funny just to give them a heads up before I go in. And so I did it early enough, but nobody got back to me. On my way into work, they texted me and said, work from home. And I'm so glad that I did that because I had already had the virus. Had I went in, I could have got other people sick. Mm-hmm. I had the virus a few days before any symptoms um, showed up. I have some friends that I went to high school with called and checked on me. Her, her um, fiancé, her son, and another friend all tested positive and the only one who got hospitalized was the friend 
Her fiance only lost his ability to smell and taste. Her son had no symptoms whatsoever. He was fine, although he tested positive. And she only um, dealt with um, the shortness of breath. So none of them, except for one, got all of the symptoms. The other one, they just got partial symptoms, and they were fine. So it depends on the individual. It depends on um, everybody in my house was exposed to me. Nobody in my house got put down. They didn't cough. They didn't have the fevers or anything. But we know they had COVID because they was, they was in close contact with me. So they've been in quarantine too, but they had no symptoms. So you can have somebody who look healthy, right. who's been exposed to it, and who's a carrier and will give it to you, but because you have underlying respiratory um, illnesses already, you'll be the one who get, you know, who have a life-threatening experience. Now, did they give you any of those um, machines they give to people who develop pneumonia? Did you, did you, how, did you develop pneumonia? As no, as thank God. Okay. So you didn't develop because, because I was reading about it already. And so, and because I get respiratory infections often whenever the season changes, mm-hmm. and because I have asthma, I know about chest PT. Mm-hmm. And chest PT is when you come cuff your hands and you beat on the back. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I've been doing that my whole life. So okay. I had... I had my husband doing that and I was already drinking hot tea and I was making myself cough so that I can get all the phlegm up. So none of that stuff was able to settle in me to cause the pneumonia to come in. And a lot of people, because they don't know that, I see that it's being shared now. But if you don't know to do that, that's how, because I have a cousin who was hospitalized with me, she had pneumonia and tested positive for COVID. But thank God she didn't have to go into ICU. They just continued with the IV antibiotics. But mm-hmm. because I knew to do those things, I was already um, self-treating myself so that it wouldn't settle in. Right. And did you have the sore throat? Because, you know, when everything first came out, it was fever, sore throat, and yes. cough. That was it. And it sneeze. You know. And if somebody sneezed, yes. My throat was burning. And um, that's why I wasn't sure. Because it will resemble a regular respiratory infection if you're not careful. What made me, I don't know if you've seen this post that I put up there, but what made me nervous is I told my husband, my eyeballs are hurting. And he said, drink some tea. And I'm like, this guy, (laughs) he is the answer for everything. But I looked it up. I Googled it. And I'm like, what makes your eyeballs hurt? Mm -hmm. And it was like, if you have an infection or virus in your body, Mm -hmm. And I'm like, something's not right because I've never experienced my eyes hurting like this. I mean, I've had eye pain before, but not like that. And then the next day when I woke up and couldn't smell nothing, you know, I'm like, God, why are you cleaning with ammonia? Where did you even get ammonia from? He was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So all of those were red flags to make me say, okay, them babies... And I'm not mad. I tell, because my kids was like, Ma, I don't get no more babies. And I'm like, well, I'm not. But it's not the babies. It was the adult right. who didn't do what they were supposed to do. Right. Right. You know, and that's the thing. We have to be mindful. That's what I'm telling everybody. Even if you don't care if you get it, be mindful of the people you're going to come in contact with. Right. Care about right. somebody else because it's killing people. I don't care what conspiracy theory is out. Right. You could say it's coming from the towers. You could say it's coming from something that they're spraying in the air. Whatever the case is, it's working and right. it's killing people. Um, my son is a musician, and one of um, the 
groups here in Connecticut. The bass player, 26 years old. He's 26. He died the other day from COVID-19. A 26-year-old, yes. So it's not something to, you know, debate about. We need to stay away from people, stay home, and really treat this thing like it's serious. Yes, I believe in the power of God, and the way that I'm fighting is on my knees. I'm praying and I'm seeking God, but at the same time, I'm not tempting him. I'm not going outside and saying, you know, I'm covered by the blood. If you read the scripture, he told the Israelites, stay in. Right. Could put the blood on each side of the doorpost, but you stay in the house. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm staying home. I'm keeping my family home and we're prayerful. We're praying for people and we're just trying, I'm just trying to get back to full health because I'm not there yet, but every day I feel better. Well, that's good. That's good. And, I, and my prayers will continually be with you and your family and with everybody and their families as well, because from you know, from from the uh, the articles and things that we re- we read about, a lot of these people that are dying, you know, their bodies they're just being burnt, correct? I mean, unless yeah, <laughs> somebody yeah, I put a um post up today about Potter's Hill in New York. I think you're familiar with Potter's Hill, right? Yeah. And so they're taking the patients now, the COVID-19 patients, putting them in a truck and burying them in Potter's Hill. And somebody said, well, no, that's because people are not claiming them. I'm like, that's not the case with everybody. There's no room in these um, these cemeteries. And so people, loved ones are being taken and put in a field. And the, the worst part about it is they're dying a lonely death. There's nobody there with them. There's no loved one there to hold their hand because they're not allowed in the hospital. So it, it's lonely and then not even being able to say your final goodbye right. because you have the law out now, 10 people or less. And so you have in virtual funerals. And I get it. It's to protect and it's right. for safety. But if we just do what we are supposed to do as well as put our faith in God, we can put, this can end and, you know, we can, we can get back to life as normal. We need to pray that God give the scientists wisdom that he showed them how to, what to do, come up with a cure, find an answer so that, you know, this can be taken care of once and for all. Right. Well, I'm pretty, well, you said they eventually came and got the babies, but I hope they took them to get the proper care. And I, it, it, That's a story in itself. Till this day, till this day, I have not heard, I haven't gotten a call saying we took the babies to get tested, and I begged them to. I said they need to be tested before you put them in someone else's house. Wow them. They said to me, you might as well keep them since you're already exposed. Why would you expose us and someone else? And so um, wow. the support worker called me. I can hear the nervousness in his voice because he called me um, while I was at my primary care doctor's office. And I said, I'm about to be tested because I have symptoms. He said, let me know. Then when he called me back, I was admitted in the hospital. And he was like, what can we do for you? What do you need? How can we help? Oh, don't ask those questions now. You didn't listen to me in the initial call. And the main concern was keep the babies so that no one else is exposed. Well, my children want their mom too. You didn't take that into consideration. So my, my doctor wants to know, he said, by law, they were supposed to tell me about the babies right. and they were supposed to tell me whether they tested positive or not. I haven't heard from them. Yeah, so I don't true. know the outcome of the babies. Wow. And they're probably not going to reach back out to you either. Right. Because you can hold them, hold them liable for that as well. Oh, I, I'm soon as I can talk 
Listen. good enough without choking. Mm. You believe <laughs> that mm. be hell mm. liable. Mm. It's so sad. Because yes. Because at the end of the day, they didn't care about you as well or your children. Mm-hmm. I, I I said to them, and I didn't share this part because I didn't think it was relevant, but that night, when I was calling them, I said, somebody needs to come get them so that I can go see about myself. Well, why don't you have your husband get them and you go over there? And I said, well, I want my husband with me. Well, he can't be with you anyhow. And so I'm going back off with somebody on the phone. I finally get the kids home and the cops come and knock on my door mm-hmm. and say, got a report that um, for Etta Hinton that she was saying she didn't want the kids and she was going to drop them off somewhere. So DCF called wow. the police on me, exactly. But because this is how the favor of God works, because the cops, they said to me, they were New Haven police officers and I live in the town of Hamden. So rightfully, they wasn't even supposed to come to my house. But they said, when we looked in the system and seen it was you, we didn't want to send Hamden because we knew something had to be wrong. I said, well, come in my house and look at the kids. They're safe. I would never do that. I said, but who called? So they was trying to protect DCF. But when I told them, I said, come on. I just want to warn you, the kids have fevers and respiratory um, symptoms. They wouldn't step foot in my house. They was like, no, ma'am, you're okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but so the whole ordeal was jacked up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just, my main thing would keep me positive and not focusing on all that other stuff is I'm still here to talk to you mm-hmm. and other and tell them my experience because I, like I said, I've seen so many people in the last week, leave us because of this virus. So I just give God glory because my, and my husband can be one of the ones in mourning right now. So I, I, I don't focus on the negative. My main concern is giving God the glory and telling my testimony yes. so that people know that there is hope. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody don't have to die right. and everybody's not dying. Amen. Amen. It is not your time. You have a lot more to do. And your, your, your missionary work and pastoral work and, and the people that you can reach and you're a minister of songs and everything, and you meant to touch many, many more people, you know. And, so, and, and you're touching me and you're touching my viewers, and, you know. So, yeah, you have a lot more work in you to do. <laughs> it's bad. A lot more work. Wow. Whew, this is a lot. And I'm, Wow. I didn't expect to hear all that, but it's not surprising at the same time. It's not surprising because we live in a wicked world, but a lot of wicked yeah. people, you know? Yeah. And, um, wow. So anything else you would leave um, that you would like to tell my viewers um, in addition to some of the things that you already mentioned about, um, you know, staying home and, of course, following all the proper protocols of washing for 20 seconds and, of number one, power of prayer and being yes. mindful and respectful of other people. Is there anything else? The main thing I say is just as much as, as hard as it is, my husband looked at me tonight and said, I can't do another day like this. The days are too long. And I laughed at him. And you know, the days are going by quick for me. I say you're getting cabin fever. <laughs> if you get cabin fever, yeah. you just make yourself realize what's outside and find something creative to do. Create a game, write a business plan, write a book, do something that you always said you wanted to do if you had the time to do it. Well, God has given you the time to do it. Sit down and and don't let the time go by and be idle and wasted, binge watching TV and all that. Put it to good use. And so that when we come out of this, 
When we come on the other side, you can be prepared and ready to face the world with all the opportunities. Because I'm, I really believe that there's going to be great opportunities when this is all over, but it's not going to benefit anybody anything if you're not prepared to embrace the opportunities. So instead of looking at things negative, and I know this is a time period that is hard for people who live alone mm-hmm. and do depression already, my thing is to use the power of technology as much as you can. FaceTime somebody or Google Duo, whatever that that other one is called. Call somebody, you know, do as much as you can to stay connected with the outside world without going outside. Because even in a supermarket, you have to still encounter people and you just never know. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. People, you know... People are not trusting God to the point that, you know, hairstylists and barbers, people, nail technicians, they're making house calls. It's not worth it. Don't do it because you don't know who's been in that house, what their lifestyle is or anything. Stay home because even though you may be strong enough to overcome it, the next you come in contact with, it will kill them. That's true. That's true. That is a great, great point to um, point out to folks. And if I must, if I must add something to that, um, this is a very good time because you know, in addition to what you said, you know, like you said, a lot of people can't handle the isolation of being mm-hmm. at home or constantly around. Um, their mates <laughs> or right. their children, you know, or just going out and doing certain things. And some people are committing suicide. I don't know. Um, uh, and, that, and I read also that domestic violence um, just spiked up some as well, you know. It's yeah. so sad. Yeah. But um, yeah. this is a time to definitely get connected to God. To yes. Get that relationship with God. Because yes. as one enters into a hospital, they're entering in alone. Yep. So if I had to tell people, get to know God for yourself and get your soul right because yep. at the end of the day, it's not about a career, it's not about a job, it's not about a mate, it's not about your children, it's not about anything materialistic because when your eyes close, there is no coming back. Yep. I've told so many people over the course of the week alone, I said, everybody's worried about the rapture. But are you rapture ready for your personal rapture? It's not about the end of the world. What about your end? And it's time to repent. I don't care what you think you've accomplished and how many preaching engagements you have, how many prophecies that were accurate. Still repent because you, we just don't know. You, you, you really don't know. And as you said, there's people who are who are giving up. You can't believe everything you see on social media, but I've seen a video pretty disturbing of they said this person committed suicide because of um COVID nineteen wow. and they from the building and it was yeah, so disheartening. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm like, if only he knew God, if only People knew, and the what what gives me joy is, and I was saying this on my church conference line tonight. We did our last seven say, sayings virtually, and I said the the great thing is God is going to get the glory regardless. Mm-hmm. Even the atheists are saying, "God help us," and be, it's because everybody is in a moment of uncertainty, and they don't know. So they can only go to the source that knows it all. And if we, the church, just because we can't get to our buildings and have our traditional services, the the Lord has given us an opportunity to evangelize to the world. If we get on posts and do what we're supposed to do, 
there will be such an awesome revival. And I don't mean with everybody coming together, being in one place, but revival will be individually in our homes and in our hearts. People yeah. will want to come back to God. We just have to do what we are supposed to do. And if, if, if the opportunity is right here, right. people who are looking for hope, and all we have to do is present it to them. Some people will only see Jesus when they look at you. Are they going to want him after they see you? Or are they going to, you know, shun away from him? Right. It's up to you as the church right. to represent God the right way. Right. That's exactly. Completely true. I tell people, I said, um, you know, it's great. We're supposed to be supposed to be up under leadership and we're supposed to fellowship with one another. That's where we gain our strength and knowledge. But the true test is getting to know him for yourself. Yes, you know, it's because at the end of the day, I've had to talk to some people because I was like, okay, you're speaking truth, you, but some of the things because of um, some hangups from past lifestyle of a uh, certain language that they speak, you know, they will go back and forth. And it's like, you can't, you can't speak God. And then, you know, you, 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 you're cursing or you, <laughs> you, you right. tell your name right. off and you, you're going to lose people. You're going to lose you people like you. that, you know, and you don't want to yep. lose people. You don't want to be responsible for losing anyone, you know, so you have to choose. And if you can't because you're still hung up, then take a step back until you get yourself together. You know? Exactly. Don't be exactly. like a lot of these preachers and singers, choir directors, and people that are doing things that they shouldn't do, but they're still out there trying to preside over people. You know, you can't do that. Listen, <laughs> the world knows the truth, and they know they know real, and they know who's not real. And that what I like about them is they will tell you in a heartbeat. They don't mind telling you they have nothing to lose. And so my whole thing is don't hurt yourself. Don't ruin your own witness. Right. If you this for the wrong reasons, go sit down somewhere. Right. Because church his <laughs> what <laughs> makes me what makes me laugh is God he he does things and you He'll leave you puzzled. People who was doing church for a business just lost their job. Yeah. Because the truth of the matter is the economy is being attacked. People don't have money. So they're not, they're not giving you tithes and offering like they would if you was in a building. So you, you're not getting that same amount of money. And I thank God that I have a full-time job. And my church has never given me a red cent to do ministry because I do it from my heart. Right. But how it's supposed to be. Right. If, for the people who are in it to get their bills paid, what you going to do now? Right. What are you doing now? Right. This has to be about the souls. Yes. Oh, the, product, oh, yes. the product of the church is the souls. And if you don't care about the souls, you need to go somewhere and sit down. Okay, see, girl, you about to have us on the phone for a whole another hour and a half. <laughs> girl, I mean, this could go on and on and on. I promise you it can. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true, and it's so sad, and you can't play with God. People are not scared. They're not, they're not, they're not really fearful like they should be. But, again, when their eyes are closed, they have That's no right. excuses. None. That's but Miss yes, Hinton, thank you so much, girl. Please keep me posted on your results. And I sure will. I will be praying for you. You are a warrior and an overcomer because you are battling so many things. Your body is just upside down. Oh my gosh! And you are still overcoming all the obstacles the devil is trying to throw at you. Yes, I give God glory. Girl, I'm giving you for a, this a virtual hug. <laughs> But seriously, though, you are, you are, you are a living testimony. And if nobody have ever witnessed anybody else's testimony, I hope from them here in this interview, they'll be blessed and they be and they will be encouraged. Amen. As well. So thank you so much. And um, thank you. 
inviting me. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. And so keep me posted. Oh, and let everybody know where they can um, find you at as well. Um, my name is Etta Hinton. That's spelled E-T-T-A-H-I-N-T-O-N. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, too, but I don't really go up there too much. So if you want to interact, you can find me on Facebook. Got it. And I'll put it in the description as well. So, um, all right, you guys, there you have it. The the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, so hope you take <laughs> heed and... Good night, everybody. Always remember to, let's talk about it. Good night.